We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, and amongst the places Winston Churchill declared the Second World War would be fought was on the seas and oceans. This is the battleground for today's highly requested Nightmare Fuel episode, Das Boot. I'm going to be covering the 1981 version, though I may get to the 2018 series down the line, and I'm going all in on this one, not the two and a half hour film version. For this video I've watched the near five hour uncut version. Before I jump in, please consider becoming one of the first subscribers for our upcoming second channel project, The Horror Exchange. Links are below. But for now, let's dive into the depths of Wolfgang Peterson's masterwork. Das Boot is an adaptation of the 1973 novel of the same name, written by World War II war correspondent Lothar Gunther Buchheim about his personal experience aboard the German naval U-boat, the U-96. Despite being written from a personal recollection, this film doesn't focus on an individual's experience. Instead, it highlights the crew as a unit of individuals, all mattering, all contributing, all together. It's a respectable camaraderie between these men who are pitted in a psychologically exhausting form of warfare, the combat of submarines. As our opening credits state, 40,000 U-boat officers went to war, 30,000 never returned. Prior to jumping into the video, I'll give a quick context for some of the major characters in the film and of my analysis. The captain of the U-96 is mostly referred to as Captain, though is nicknamed the Old Man by the crew. Then there's Lieutenant Werner, who is the boat's war correspondent, playing the role of the book's author. And there's also Johan, who is the standout character to me for what impact serving on a U-boat can have on a man's mind. More on that later though, as it's time to set sail. I think one of the most captivating elements of Das Boot is how personable and likeable the crew is. You spend a lot of screen time with them, especially in this version, witnessing their trials and tribulations, and it's easy to form attachments with them. The captain in particular is a good man, who acknowledges the bad things they have to do, and is sympathetic towards the struggles of his crew. And the crew here also don't follow a Nazi mindset for the most part. They're just very ordinary German men with no skin agenda other than being under orders. In fact, from our introduction to the German Navy here, we can even see they are against the Nazi regime, with one captain mocking Hitler while receiving the Knight's Cross. Later in the film, when the orders from above become increasingly frustrating, the men don't shy away from airing their true thoughts. They're fighting for their country, as it's their duty, but they still oppose the storm clouds above them and the trickle-down effect that drenches them. It's even worthy to note that the more experienced men aboard the U-96, including the captain, are more cynical about warfare. Those who are young and fresh have an air of excitement and energy about them, while the veterans are the opposite. It's a clever way of informing the audience early on that the longer you're exposed to war, the deeper it can affect you. On top of this, one of the men on the sub is pro-Nazi, and he's displayed as being pompous and arrogant, while also being disliked by the rest of the men. This crew is itself an anti-war crew, still fighting for the protection of their nation, yet are confident in their opposition to the underlying rationale for the war in the first place. In terms of the location of the film, having it set mostly in the sub, with tight camera angles and crammed sets, emotes a feeling of claustrophobia. The crew of the U-96 is said to be around 50 men. 50 men like a tin of sardines, having to live together, breathing down each other's necks for several months at sea. I can only imagine what this must have been like for their psyche, only being able to get a breath of fresh air when the U-96 surfaces, treading over each other's feet, not having a lot of space to sleep or walk, and no proper opportunity to have a quiet space to yourself. The hygiene and cleanliness of 50 men is also explored in some pretty disgusting ways. It's simply not a very pleasant place to have to live, and the circumstances are far from comfortable. It's like being at war in a hostel. That to me freaks me out enough as it is, as somebody who values their personal breathing space. But the core nightmare fuel of Das 
sport to me comes through the naval combat. It's a constant game of cat and mouse with mind games galore. The U-96 travels around trying to detect and destroy enemy subs. The catch is you never truly know what's around you. You might be able to detect something, but have they detected you? Are they above you, in which case they could drop a depth charge, or are they below you? Who will fire first? Will they hit or miss? It's a dark, deep water battlefield here, where the men have to remain ultra quiet, making as little noise as possible, in case they become detectable to the enemy. Any tiny movement could go wrong and compromise the lives of the entire crew. There's also the added element of the sub's build quality as well, creating an unpredictable space. There's always danger lurking around the sub, everything from having to manage fuel consumption properly, the pressure underwater is capable of making bolts burst like bullets, gaskets become in need of repair while under attack. You can simply never tell how safe the sub is at any given time. The men have to put their faith in the U-96, being able to hold up both outside of and within conflict. Das Boot has multiple sequences where there is a conflict and the tension is gasp inducing, especially when the U-96 begins to be attacked. The shaky cam filming, the loud bangs of the chaos around, the desperation to try and deal with flooded parts of the sub, repairing equipment, all of it combines into states of sheer panic. These men have to maintain a sense of control and focus, despite at any moment they're at risk of being blown to bits. It's a pressure cooker environment with nowhere to run. They just have to work together and keep composed in order to survive. Each man has to trust one another and remain calm. However, in the case of Johan, we have an officer who cracks under the pressure. His facial expressions are genuinely unforgettable, illustrating his fright at what is going on, and he has to be restrained. It makes you feel sorry for these guys, because half the battle is fought by their mental fortitude. It is so easy to shatter to pieces in this environment, especially when it's said that only the captain knows their final destination. They've just got to carry on with trust and hope, never really knowing what's coming next, and that very much brings about the feeling of a fear of the unknown. Yet it's not just the stress levels of the men which are tested, but their morality. This comes after a battle against the British, where the U-96 barely makes it out the victor. On the surface, the British jump off their ship and try to swim for the U-96, begging for help amongst the flames. However, the captain orders that the U-96 backs off. It's not an easy decision to make, and the captain acknowledges that, but it's necessary. The U-96 is already limited in terms of space and supplies, so they have no choice but to abandon the British, otherwise they may just very well compromise their own survival. It's like the Germans see a part of themselves in the enemy. They're just ordinary men like them, who probably oppose the war like them, and they are in desperate need of help or they'll die. Turning away from them when they possess a great deal of empathy is a truly saddening moment in the story. But there is a slight silver lining. After over 60 days at sea, the men are able to return home for Christmas. Yet, in their excitement, it's revealed that they have been detoured to Italy via Spain. This dampens the morale of the men severely. It's another obstacle faced in the film. A lot of the time, they struggle to keep engaged in a normal manner. They wind up missing reality, their homes, their families, their regularity. This place, for them, is so far away from their ideals. And the longer they spend at sea, the further they drift from their comfort zones. When they get to their rendezvous in Spain, we see that the Nazi officers who greet and feed them are very much in a comfort zone though. It's an intentionally irritating and uppity exchange between the U-96's crew and the SS Vesa. The Vesa is armed with a glorious banquet, a lot of space to move around, fancy clothing. It's like a palace compared to what the U-96 crew have experienced. And yet, the Vesa's men still find a way to be torn deaf to the perils of naval warfare. They haphazardly inquire about how many enemy subs they've sunk, not realising the emotional emotional difficulty they've faced. 
Furthermore, the Versa men mention how it can be difficult on their ship. When this looks like the Titanic in comparison to the U-96, that's because we the audience spend such a large amount of screen time following the U-96's journey. We see the challenges they've faced, and that only makes the Nazis on the Versa come across as even more ignorant and blasé. There's still some tough obstacles for the U-96 yet though, as in order to get to Italy, they've got to go through through a very uncomfortable zone indeed, passing through the heavily occupied Strait of Gibraltar. This is a direct order from command, and the men despite buys this decision. They know the Nazi regime so well that if they disobeyed their direct order, they could face punishment. So they go into the jaws of the British Navy, knowing that it's their only real option. They cannot reason with the unreasonable, so they're faced with a literal do or die decision, where the doing could still involve dying, a real rock and a hard place situation to be in. But this only gets worse for the men when the U-96 is severely damaged in Gibraltar and sinks into the depths, luckily landing on a sea shelf. Here they face a ridiculously tough test. They are right on the verge of the pressure crushing them to death. The oxygen is constantly running out, and there is a vast amount of repairs required. Just imagine being in this place. You're on the brink of death with air running out by the minute, and you've got to focus to fix everything in order to resurface. The U-96 is a ticking time bomb here, providing an exhausting challenge to the men which they barely escape. Mentally, the very thought of being trapped in that place, facing those odds while battling oxygen starvation and extremely high air pressure, it's nightmare inducing to contemplate. Thankfully, the crew managed to surface the U-96, and there's such a wonderful sense of relief. They've done it, they've got past Gibraltar, and they make it to their rendezvous point in Italy. We've spent nearly five hours with these men. In terms of screen time, it's felt like we've lived with them on this journey. We've seen their resilience, their heart, their drive, their courage, and their humanity. They've looked after one another, fought against the odds, been through horrendous decisions which scar them all, but they got through it, and you can breathe a sigh of relief having rooted for them all this time. And then, the airstrike hits, bombs drop on the dock, the U-96 is destroyed, and the majority of the crew with it. This for me is one of the biggest gut punches I've seen covering war content on this channel. This minute long attack kills off dozens of men, including the captain and Johan. All of their efforts, everything they've been through, all the hope they held in their hearts to carry them to the finish line was for nothing. They're dead in an instant. This is a valuable lesson on perspective. Sure, from the British point of view, an enemy sub and many officers have have been taken out. Fantastic result. But from the German point of view, and the audiences, we've just seen a hell of a lot of good men killed right when we thought they'd survived. War is cruel, it's unforgiving, and it is not selective. Das Boot makes it abundantly clear how precious life is, how easily it can be taken away, and that within every war there are ordinary men and extraordinary ones, but bullets and bombs do not care in the slightest about the merit of character. This thing teleports you into a sombre, isolated, crammed, high-pressure environment where death lurks in the shadows of the ocean. And in the end, no matter how hard you fight for what's right, the end can come just like that. This is a staggering creation, one of the all-time greatest German productions. And good lord, will it stick with me for years to come. These are my reasons as to why Das Boot is nightmare fuel. Thank you for watching this episode. If you have any recommendations for me to investigate, please let me know in the comments below. Before I go, I'd love to quickly shout out an upcoming Blu-ray release from our friends at Eureka. On the 28th of August, they are dropping their Blu-ray box set of Andrzej Zielowski films, including The Third Part of the Night, The Devil, and On the Silver Globe. This limited edition box set is only getting 3,000 copies, so if you're in Region 2 and want to check out some unsettling European cinema, take a look at the link in the description. I'm Connor from Unleash the Ghouls, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time with another dose of Nightmare Fuel. Yeah.